see the entire schedule of what we're doing for a week in advance and four or five days after that event. Uh, it's a tremendous event plan and schedule. Um, Admiral Tom Fargo is the chairman of the, of the committee. Our, uh, our chairman for the Pacific Aviation Museum, Ron Hayes, is chaired that in 1950, and it turned out to be just an absolutely fantastic event. Uh, yeah. I mention that because so much of aviation, World War II, again, how many airplanes did we make in World War II? <laughs> Greater than 25,000, I think, is a uh, number that uh, are a rough uh, ballpark. Uh, tremendous, tremendous history of uh, building airplanes. And to be able to talk about that here in the cradle of aviation, where Republic, <coughs> Curtis, or Grunman, all kinds of airplanes really had their roots. Now, we talk about the airplanes, but we also talk about the airfields around. We're fortunate because if you think of we're in a spot where the war began, where the first bombs fell, where we still have craters in the ground around the museum, where bullet holes are still visible in buildings, whether it's on Hickam or whether it's on uh, in Pearl Harbor, but where things are still very relevant as we talk about history to children, to parents, to heroes, to veterans, that are interested in making sure that their stories get remembered and told. And now we have an opportunity to do it here. So let me take just a quick moment. I got to introduce, uh, you already got to hear um, from Andrew. Andrew uh, gets to be the executive director here. And, uh, and so let's start with Andrew. And then uh, Jerry. Uh, Jerry has a very unique background also. 30 years in museum business and having the opportunity, again, at another historic airfield, Bradley Field, it's been around for an awful long time. Fort Island was the first, one of the first Army airfields in 1960. Both of these were down here at the same time, starting out. And so, um, let's have a great couple hours, or a good, good hour here. Um, Andrew, you're next. Thanks very much. Um, normally don't get two rounds of applause in one day, so we uh, In any case, I'm going to um, hopefully not screw this up too much, but um, I want to thank you for the opportunity to talk to you a little bit about the uh, crater of aviation. Uh, what I'm going to share with you is probably not going to be earth shattering to most of you. Um, and in fact, you're probably in a situation, hopefully not, but you know, you're probably gonna say, been there, done that, for some of the things I'm gonna talk about. Um, and again, some of the solutions we may have implemented uh, are not designed necessarily to knock your socks off, but you know, so you're probably asking yourself, why am I in this session and not in the theater? Um, well, I'd like you to look at this more as a therapy session. And, and it's not a therapy session for you, it's, it's for me. <laughs> um, in most cases, um, you know, running a not-for-profit museum, whether it's air and space or something else, you, uh, you tend to deal with day-to-day -day things that come up, and some of them seem unique and a little overwhelming. You go home, and you share your troubles with your significant other, um, and sometimes you find a sympathetic ear, or in my case, you may have a spouse who doesn't entirely understand everything I'm talking about, but is very willing to give me suggestions about how to solve the Unfortunately, most of the suggestions revolve around fire everyone, um, quit, or blow up a place. You know, it's generally not work. So it's not stuff you can generally take and implement the next day, even though she may want you to do that. Um, so in any case, let's start the session. Hi, I'm Andy. I'm director of an Air and Space Museum. Hi. Hi, Andy. Yeah, they didn't even have to prompt you. This is great. We've all been in therapy sessions before. <laughs> um, in any case, let's begin. So I'm going to talk about money, politics, location, and what I'm going to is a common museum tale. Um, so what I first want to talk about, let's see if I get this right. Great. All right. Initially, there was great vision in putting this museum together, and Josh Stopp has already filled you in a little bit on the rich history that Long Island has enjoyed. What I'd like to start with is this vision of the founders. 
Mitchell Field shut down in the early 60s, and starting in the 70s, a group of local historians and aviation buffs started collecting aircraft and artifacts that had a connection to this region. The two main hangars, which are over here, that house the bulk of the collection, became home to a group of men who began the process of restoring significant aircraft and then opening up a small museum. It was fondly called a place with dirty old planes and dirty old hangars with dirty old men. <laughs> and it kept that for quite a while. Um, over the course of the next 10 years, they lobbied the local county government regarding their idea to build the first class air and space museum, along with a group of other museums on what is the museum in Rome. We have a firefighter's museum, we have a children's museum, and we have a historic carousel. But now here's where it gets a little interesting. They sold the local county government on the concept that this museum was going to be profitable and that it would pay the county profits every year. Huh. Okay? It's easy, you've all done it. I'm sure this is one of those things that you every day. Now, and their plan worked. At least the plan about getting the county to pay for the museum, not the part about the profit side. Uh, that didn't happen. Uh, the museum is owned by Nassau County, uh, managed by a public-private partnership that we work for, so we're not county employees. And from the very beginning, the idea was that the county was going to be there and that they would serve as the white knight. So whenever there's a problem, pick up the phone, call your contact with the county, they bail you out. Oh, sorry. Didn't happen. The museum was actually founded under a Republican, local Republican administration. This is a predominantly Republican community in Nassau County, uh, but it opened under a brand new Democratic administration. Um, the new county government came in full of fire and brimstone and inherited a crushing budget deficit with a mandate to cut expenses. So they looked at the cradle, and again, keep in mind this is owned by the local county government, as a perfect target. So right after the museum opened in 2002, we became what I'd like to call a political pinata. Uh, we were targeted as an example of the previous administration's reckless spending, and we were questioned about whether we would survive. And this happened every day. Needless to say, the constant barrage did nothing for our future prospects, whether it was school groups or catering opportunity, anything that was going to take place next month, six months, or a year, People were saying, you guys are not going to be open. So that hurt us quite a bit. On top of that, what small operational support the county was giving us was shifted to another institution by a local legislator who saw blood in the water. The great vision of the founders was saddled with some bad decisions and assumptions. Uh, bad contracts with the theater and simulator rides tied our hands and drained revenue. The county basically stopped paying for the construction bills when the museum opened and forced the museum to take a <coughs> bad bank debt. How we got the loans, I have no idea. Why a bank would give a loan to a not-for-profit at the very beginning of time, I have no idea. I spent 20 years in banking and still have not figured that out. But they got the loan. Um, the board of the museum set up by the county was originally an advisory board. And they had no financial um, responsibility. And they took that very seriously. They did not provide any financial support to the museum at all, whether in contacts or raising money. Uh, there was no endowment fund established, and no real fundraising efforts took in place to support the general operations in place. Again, the theory was that the county was always going to be there. And what a surprise after the first year when attendance dropped quite a bit. After all this, the county stepped in and forced a major reorganization of the board and the staff. So the writing was on the wall. We had to either change or die. <coughs> One of the main things we had to do was look inside and outside. So for us, the gloom and doom the museum faced in just its first few years, there was an underlying attitude internally that needed to change. And the word was no. You can afford to say no when you're financially secure. Or in the case of the cradle, you say no because you think you're financially secure, which is even worse. So it was viewed early on that the county would never let the museum fail and that they would always find a way to support the place. Unfortunately, that wasn't going to happen the way the economy was. And uh, living through this, we knew that they were never going to be the white knight. 
So internally, internally, we needed to be a lot more open-minded, and the message was sent internally that no is not part of our vocabulary any longer. We needed to create new revenue streams that would support the general operations of the museum, and we needed to restore confidence amongst the general public. No easy task, but you have to start somewhere. I used to gauge public confidence every year at the annual air show at Jones Beach. Uh, generally drew about a half a million people each year. And I would man a booth on the boardwalk with our volunteers, handing out stuff, coupons, things like that. For the first few years, uh, I would say that the bulk of the questions were, oh, what are you guys closed? You're still open? And that happened every year for the first few years. Slowly but surely, the number of those comments started to recede. Now, we could have easily hunkered down and focused internally on all our problems, but instead we made a concerted effort to get out into the marketplace and start building confidence, almost one constituency at a time. We needed to prove that the museum was not just a static experience, but was a valuable resource for educators and the business community. It was kind of like our listening tour. Education first and foremost. Up until this point, our educational efforts centered around the traditional class trip. Uh, you know the one where the bus pulls up, 50 kids run off, run through the museum, the teacher and chaperones kind of sit in the lobby, <laughs> reading, eating lunch, whatever, <laughs> kids destroying your museum, they get back on the bus, teacher hopes that they've counted right and they started with 50 and they go back. That was the focus. We ended up with some spares from time. Uh, Due to its unpredictability, we need to be more proactive in getting schools to come to the museum. Most schools have one opportunity for a class trip, and obviously we wanted them to think of the trade first. The first year being a novelty, uh, and for the first few years, our emphasis was entirely on history. We needed to change the focus, so like others, we focused on STEM, turning the lesson plans and museum exhibits more about the science and technology than just the history. One big challenge on Long Island is that we have to deal with over 120 independent public school districts. I know in some of your markets, you probably have a centralized school district that you deal with. We don't have that budget. So from Nassau to Suffolk, and we are, there's a point around this, right? I'll do this. We're about here, in this general vicinity. So there's about 50 to 60 school districts here and then another 50 that go all the way out here. So, and think of that, it's 120 school districts and probably over 500 schools, and that doesn't even count the number of private schools out here. So each of those are a client, each of those are a customer, each of those we need to build a relationship with. So, what we did was we basically started small. We started and said, put a, Stake in the map where the cradle is, threw a circle around it within a half an hour driving distance, and started to build relationships one at a time. As we got that first circle, we expanded the circle and keep going out. Now, I'll be honest with you, we're not getting a lot of uh, school trips from Montauk, which is out here, but from kind of this part of western Suffolk County on, we've been fairly successful in getting most of these school trips and partnerships going. But again, it's one at a time. Um, after that was accomplished, as I said, we continue to expand the circle and we continue that process today. The Westbury STEM Magnet Academy. Now I mentioned this briefly inside, and for me, I'm a big believer that you make your own work. About eight years ago, we were approached by the Westbury School District, which sits about a half an hour north of here. Um, they were faced with an overcrowding situation in the high school. And were either looking to rent a classroom somewhere nearby or build another trailer in the parking lot. So they came to us basically just to rent a room. I mean, we've had, historically, we've had classrooms physically here in the museum. But after a couple of months of meeting here, collectively between the school and the museum, we thought it'd be a real shame to bust kids here and then stick them in a room when you have this great museum uh, as part of it. So the concept of the STEM Magnet Academy was created. Uh, as I mentioned before, it's about 109th and 10th graders who spend half of every school day here for their classes in math and science. The students are in the classroom space for theory and then periodically will use the museum's collection to illustrate the theory. To give you an idea of logistically how it works, 
Ninth graders arrive here about 7.45 in the morning. Um, they get off, go into class, use the museum, as I said, periodically. They're here till about 11, when the 10th graders come on a bus. The bus takes the ninth graders back to the high school. The 10th graders who spent the morning at the high school are here till about 1 o'clock. So they switch off, use the same rooms, and the same teachers. Um, for us, our education staff will work with their teachers to integrate the museum's collection into the curriculum on a regular basis. And the district is one of five underserved districts in Nassau County. So the cohort of students is 100% minority students, and consistently two-thirds of the students have been girls. Um, to get into the program, they needed a proficiency in math uh, at the eighth grade level, uh, which allows them to tackle physics as freshmen, which I mentioned to you before. And what they've been finding is that using physics as your base of science instead of life science uh, has eased the path in which these students can go on to chemistry and then life science. So it seems to be something that has been working very well. Historically, in the district, the students who are taking physics as juniors, only about 50 to 60 percent are passing the state regents exams in physics. This group of freshmen, it's about 85 percent. Uh, so it's statistics we've been able to, to uh, brag about from the standpoint that the kids are in a different environment. And these are not all just honor students. Uh, the neat thing about it is it's a program of students who are probably B students, but are able to utilize uh, an unusual environment for learning. Uh, and even their teachers uh, have to do the same thing. So it's a little bit different than out-of-the-box thinking. The unique part, as I mentioned, is the physics part. Um, and with it finishing its eighth year, it has provided us with direct revenue from the school district. Um, and probably more importantly, it's really helped us create a strong education platform that we could then use. So, stronger educational platform. With the partnership with Westbury, we've been able to add, have meaningful conversations with other school districts because we're not just talking about the school system. We're talking about how we can help integrate a collection of aircraft and spacecraft and the science and technology behind it and really enliven their studies. We've been able to create what we call STEM partnerships with several school districts. A lot of these are close by. And what that involves is at the elementary and middle school level is a specific class that will make multiple visits here over the course of the school year. And then we make multiple visits to the school. So it's museum outreach as well as uh, their being here on a frequent basis. So again, we're integrating the collection into the curriculum on a regular basis. What this gives us is predictable, sustainable revenue. I'm not worried about so much about individual class trips because I do have these partnerships, which I know when they're coming, I know what money is coming in from. Our education platform has opened the doors for new grants, uh, primarily due to what I call having more meat on the bones. In uh, New York State, a little about three or four years ago, they created the Empire State STEM Learning Network. There are essentially 10 hubs around the state uh, designated to foster a partnership between education and business. On Long Island, there are two hubs. The Suffolk County hub is Brookhaven National Lab. In Nassau County, the cradle is designated as the STEM hub. Um, so we're proud of that designation because again, it helps us tell our story. All of this would not have been possible with the old attitude we had, that attitude about no. Uh, we would not have said yes to Westbury. We would have not said yes to changing our focus. Um, so clearly it shows the power of the word yes. Now, in the museum galleries, changing exhibits in an air and space museum is no easy task. We're not an art gallery, we can't simply change a few pictures. And for the cradle, we're a little bit landlocked. We have some room to grow, but not a lot. So what do you do to get people back? Well, with a more positive attitude, we looked at how to reinterpret the stories in galleries, tying more of the exhibits to science, curriculum, and providing us with an opportunity to sell to more school districts. Josh and his crew have diligently worked to add a variety of creative interactives, which you'll see when you walk through the galleries. And they're very popular with not just school groups, but with the general visitor. So every time you come here, I mean, I started here about 11 years ago. 
and I would tell you that in the first couple of years, I was still walking around going, has that always been there? You know? <laughs> can't absorb everything that's here. And for the general visitor, it's almost like a new visit when they come, because there is so much stuff. But we do try to reinterpret things as we go along, so it isn't just the same story. Something else we were experiencing over the course of the first few years was the drop off of visitors buying tickets for the IMAX giant screen theater, which you were just sitting in. Um, I don't have to go into the deep details about our IMAX relationship. Suffice to say, it wasn't a good one. Um, and with IMAX focusing on more commercial films, a uh, great deal of confusion was taking place in the marketplace. Any time a film came out in IMAX, everybody thought we'd be able to show it here. Unfortunately, the technology that was in commercial theaters was not translated into dome theaters effectively. So we got shut out. Or we were told things like, after having great success with films like Harry Potter and Batman initially, we were told, you're going to get the next Harry Potter, but you're going to get it two weeks after it opens, which is a waste of time. So we uh, worked diligently on um, getting out of our IMAX relationship and debranding ourselves from IMAX. And we were lucky enough to get into an alliance with the National Geographic Society, excuse me, which fits perfectly with our educational mission. We also embarked on an ambitious project to add a digital planetarium system to our giant screen theater. We were lucky enough to gain the support of JetBlue, who was interested in taking the lead role in the museum. The results so far have been encouraging, but there's still work to be done in promoting the planetarium and its capabilities. Now, relevance to the business community. Uh, as Josh talked about and others have talked about, for many years Long Island was the home to some of the largest aerospace manufacturers in the country. Names like Grumman, Republic, and Sperry were mainstays on the corporate landscape for decades. Unfortunately, consolidation of the industries greatly affected the giants here on Long Island. Grumman merged with Northrop, companies like Republic just disappeared. For many, the thought was that the aerospace industry on Long Island was dead. But the reality was that most of the subcontractors that fed the large primes survived and still exist. Today, they number about 400 and employ about 20,000 people. So there's a reality that exists that affects these companies and in turn affects the museum. Gone are the opportunities to get the big check of support. Today, the companies we solicit are primarily small and mid-sized companies, so we need to create partnerships that they can afford. The reality for these companies revolves around their own goal of survival. Many are faced with an aging workforce that grew up during the space program and are now faced with, I don't know if you've ever heard this term, but I use it all the time, it's called the silver tsunami. And the silver tsunami is basically, in these companies, especially in aerospace, a large number of their employees all have hair that look like mine. And they're all retiring around the same time period. So what's happening is this flood of aerospace workers are leaving industry. For companies on Long Island, you're not importing people from the Midwest or the South or out West to come move to Long Island. It's very expensive here. The tax structure is, is overwhelming. Housing costs are overwhelming. So somebody moving from a nice area in the Midwest is going to think coming to Long Island is probably not the ideal situation. So what they have to do is, and what they need is a local labor pool, something that's brought up here. And that's where we come in. In addition to getting kids excited about STEM and, all, and using the museum, we're trying to use the museum to sell kids on career opportunities in commercial aviation and the aerospace manufacturing right here on Long Island. That's one of the reasons JetBlue got involved with us. Um, they felt within commercial aviation, everybody knows everything from a pilot and they know a flight attendant. They don't know anything in between. And for JetBlue, they felt that within 10 years, they'd probably have to create their own school uh, because they were just not seeing enough young people getting into the industry. So it's a big reason why they got involved with us. And our focus on this has made it um, more relevant to the aerospace community, and it gives them a reason to support us. Because uh, in the past, it was kind of like, well, you know, maybe I'll give you a $1,000 check. But now we're seeing slightly larger, not huge checks, but we're seeing slightly larger checks. Uh, but we're giving them that reason to be involved in the museum. 
maximizing the museum space. Um, you got to look at this place as any museum as a small business. And what you need to do is take advantage of the opportunities when they come up. We can't afford to say no, but we have to do it within reason. So, like in the Westbury School District situation, we were approached by the local chapter of United Cerebral Palsy about hosting our annual Festival of, Festival of Trees weekend, which takes place around Thanksgiving. Uh, in the old days, the answer would have been no. We would have just said, no, can't do it, won't do it. Um, and while the festival is a great deal of work on the staff here, it opened our eyes to the possibility of utilizing the museum as a venue for small cultural shows and expos. The beauty of the arrangement with these shows is that the promoter generally spends money in promotion and advertising, which benefits us. We get a percentage of the ticket sales, and in general, it's bringing new audiences to the museum who may never have thought of coming here before. For the promoter, it provides a unique way of selling their event, because in addition to the event, which invariably takes place in the atrium and in here, they get the museum. So a couple can come, and whether they're interested in the event or they're interested in the museum, kids can come and everybody's a little happy. To date, our most successful events have ranged from the Festival of Trees to a chocolate expo, which we had in the beginning of March. And for us, this is a big day. We had 11,000 people in one day, uh, which talks to the power of chocolate. <laughs> I don't get it. Because basically, people are paying money to come in and buy something. I don't know if Macy's has tried this yet, but uh, it seems to be something that works when you have a unique thing like chocolate. It was our biggest event. In addition, and this is probably pushing the envelope in terms of within reason, we host a tattoo festival. <laughs> Takes place generally around a time that is extremely slow here, in the beginning of September, first weekend in September, or the last weekend in August. For us, the great thing about it is, um, I don't know, it's probably the same in, in every part of the country, but end of August through the middle of October is dead. School groups have not kicked in. Uh, everybody's focused on what's going on at home with the new school year. So you can roll a bowling ball through here on some days and not hit anybody. So having a tattoo festival here, I will tell you if you're ever in the area, it's probably the best people watching event you will ever see in your life. Um, but it is bringing other entrepreneurs and small business people who might be in the tattoo business here, uh, but they're bringing money. Uh, and the place sells out over three days. Uh, and uh, it does very well. So I had to go to my board to make sure that they were comfortable with it, but as long as they heard that the revenue was coming in, uh, what a surprise. They said, go ahead. So again, with these types of uh, events, we get new revenue, we get free promotion and advertising, and we get new audiences. Um, so it's helped us grow as we move along. So um, in closing, this kind of sums it up. Money, we'll never have enough. Uh, in fact, I've often thought personally that uh, if we had a lot of money, I wouldn't know what to do. Because I've been so long here without any. Uh, the politics for us will always be a part of our lives. Um, a few years back, I changed my own personal political affiliation to independent. Uh, I pray for incumbency in local elections. And I pray that anyone in the government who is a big supporter of the museum does not get indicted. <laughs> I hate to teach new dogs old dogs and tricks. Uh, our location is, as you can see, we're you know 30, 35 miles outside of Manhattan. Uh, we're not in a tourist destination. Mass transit is very difficult. You need a car to get here. Uh, we're a regional museum, which where I think is a national story to tell. Uh, and it just means, really, at the end of the day, we have to work extra hard which we have been doing. I have probably uh, one of the best groups of people to work with uh, and a great crew of volunteers, number about 150 to 200. Um, and having been in the banking business for over 20 years uh, and coming to a place like this, um, this has probably been the best, most rewarding place I've ever worked for. So uh, it's something that uh, we're all very proud of, but I wouldn't have done it without the crew that are here. And probably, in addition to Josh, there's Gary sitting here, and a few other people who are, uh, you'll see walking around and crazy stuff. So, um, as I said, not earth shattering, not blowing your socks off, uh, 
but this is how we dealt with very difficult situations here at the very beginning. Um, it's not great when the you know sort of uh, people that own your place are bashing you from the very beginning. Uh, kind of hurts your feelings a little bit. Uh, also hurts the pocketbook. Uh, but we survived. We survived two hurricanes, a recession, and a really bad county government. So other than that, we're doing okay. <laughs> so thank you for your time, and I guess uh, I'm gonna. Jerry, thank you very much. Let me remind you that this is a session where the speakers are CEOs of their museums. And so you might take a moment and jot down your questions so in a few minutes after uh, Jerry's done that we can have some dialogue about how you're handling problems and, and be able to uh, sound them off of some of those that have had some more experience. Thank you very much. Jerry? Hello everyone. Um, you sent the Daddy Intrepid yesterday? Yes. How was yes. it? Great. 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 So the Intrepid is where I started my museum career. Um, the Intrepid arrived in New York in 1982 and uh, I joined the ship in 84. Uh, first as a volunteer um, and actually I went there just to see what was going on. I'm a storyteller, I'm a writer, I'm a lovely love history, and I could make anything out of anything, at least I thought I could. And I, and I ran across a group of uh, World War II veterans that were building a replica of an SC-5A, British uh, fighter from World War I. And they had everything they needed except that they couldn't build the instrumentation. And I said, I'll give that a go. And I fabricated the instrumentation in my apartment in Manhattan. And uh, from then on, I was asked to come back and keep doing exhibit projects. Uh, while doing that, I watched uh, uh, NASA teacher resource uh, educators, scientists, come in and try to teach kids how airplanes fly and how spacecraft operate. And these were NASA engineers, and these were New York City school kids, and it wasn't working. So I said, let me go with that. A typical trick I used to use is I would, we were teaching buoyancy and displacement, and I would stand the kids next to the intrepid on a gangway, and I would say to the class, well, why do things float and why do they sink? And of course, there's always this, this real smart aleck kid who wants to show how dumb the teacher is. And he says, well, of course, they, they float because they're light and they sink because they're happy. And the class cheers him. And I take a, a metal fork out of my pocket and I drop it in the river. And I said, that weighed four ounces and it sank. This ship behind me weighs 46,000 tons. And suddenly you have them. Suddenly they realize you know something they don't know. So that's how I started my career. I stayed with the Intrepid for 18 years. I went from volunteer to vice president of education exhibits. Um, I left there, went to the National Lighthouse Museum project, and then I came to Connecticut 10 years ago uh, to take over the Connecticut River Museum. So I switched from a major, major environment in New York City where we had a million visitors a year to a state that only has 3.5 million people living in it. So it's quite a change. So we're located um, up the Connecticut River, just north of Hartford, 12 miles north of Hartford. We're halfway between Boston and New York. We're at Bradley International Airport. We'll tell you a little story about it. It is the bad weather alternate for both Logan and JFK, so we've had everything from Concords to Airbuses to, to uh, 747s landing there. So we occupy six hangars uh, right next to the primary flight tower. We're located right over here. Here is the main terminals. And Bradley, well I'll say a little more about Bradley later. So our mission is to tell the story of New England's um, aerospace legacy. Now I'll admit, when I came to Connecticut 10 years ago, I didn't know much about it. Um, I was a maritime historian. Uh, I knew a lot about the colonial history of Connecticut. And in fact, the museum I worked at for the last 10 years, that's what we were all about, is the colonial history of Connecticut, the War of 1812, the very early Industrial Revolution, um, I'd heard the word Sikorsky, I'd heard the word Pratt and Whitney, but it really wasn't on my radar. Uh, I learned that Connecticut, uh, from the 1850s with early balloon flights, um, on through to today with, with uh, UTC Aerospace still making all the life support systems for the space shuttle, and the space suits that the astronauts wore on the shuttle and are wearing in the space station now, 
we've had an amazing legacy, especially Pratt and Whitney engines, which revolutionized air power in the 1920s. And then they built so many uh, engines for both civilian and military aircraft. And then, then they developed jet engines just after the war. And, and those jet engines are, are flying a lot of the aircraft that we ride in today. So our collection includes over 100 aircraft. We actually have 107 aircraft. About 60 of them are on display at any given time. Did I just do that? Okay. Uh, we have some large, important aircraft. The, um, the VS-44 is the, the last great transatlantic flying boat. It was all designed and built in Connecticut by Sikorsky. Uh, we have a wonderful B-29. We have a great collection of helicopters and pretty good aerospace collection as well. So Bradley Airfield was built uh, in 1940. In 1940, as, as England was fighting for its life in the Battle of Britain, uh, it was realized that New England might have to defend itself from the air, particularly Hartford, because uh, in Hartford, where Pratt & Whitney was building a majority of the aircraft engines in our country, we also had Colt Firearms. We had all of the major insurance companies and financial institutions that headquarters in Hartford. So we felt we might need to be prepared to defend Hartford from the air. Brainerd Airport, which was the state's largest airport at the time, which wasn't very big, uh, wasn't going to be big enough, and they knew it. So they sent, uh, they sent uh, recon airplanes up, and they located about 12 miles north of Hartford um, 